Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to Roosevelt House. My name is Lillian Barrios Paoli. I'm a senior advisor to President Jenner Rav of Hunter College. I'm also on the advisory of Roosevelt House. Uh, today is really uh, an exciting and interesting day, and I'm very happy and pleased that you're all here. Um, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Steffi Woolhandler. She's a professor of public health at Hunter College and a lecturer in medicine at Harvard Medical School. She has worked as a primary care internist for decades, has authored over 100 scientific articles on health and healthcare policy, and is a well-known advocate for nonprofit, single-payer national health insurance. Together with Dr. David Himmelstein, she's a co-editor of A Lancet, special issue publicated in April 2017, America, Equity, and Equality in Health. That served as the kindling for our conference tonight. Dr. Wolf. Thanks. Um, well, Lilium didn't really get a introduction, so I'm gonna give her that. Uh, Lilium Berrios Paoli, in addition to her roles here at Hunter, um, has, uh, was, has played a big role in New York City politics. She was deputy mayor under Bill de Blasio. She was commissioner of aging under Mayor Bloomberg. Um, she's been commissioner at four different agencies under the Koch and Giuliani administrations. So um, she's a woman of many talents, not the least of which is her ability to work with folks with very strong personalities. Um, she holds her degree uh, from the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City and also a PhD from the New School for so Social Research here in New York. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who's Paul Krugman, and many of you know his name. He's Distinguished Professor in Economics at the Graduate Center at City University of New York and the Stone Center of Socioeconomic Inequality at CUNY. Uh, he's also a very popular op-ed columnist in the New York Times, a position he's held since 2000. There's a full biography of him in your program. Um, in 2008, uh, Paul Krugman won the Nobel Prize in Economics. Uh, he's been called by Time Magazine the best financial blogger. He's won numerous other awards. He's written best-selling textbooks with his colleague Robin Wells uh, on micro and macroeconomics. And before coming to CUNY, uh, he served on the faculties of MIT, Yale, Stanford, and most recently, Princeton University. Uh, Paul Krugman. Well, thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, I, of course, I, this is, I feel like I'm just uh, CUNY hopping here since my office is, uh, is, is at another piece of CUNY and it, it's great. I uh, just want to say what a great institution the whole CUNY system is. We, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, so I feel a little bit like a ringer here. I'm not a healthcare uh, professional or expert, obviously. And I'm not even a healthcare economist. I, I play one on TV occasionally because I have to. Uh, I'm, uh, my role as, uh, in all of this discussion that we've had has been more one of uh, trying to um, act as a conduit as to, to, to uh, bring ideas across, maybe help uh, push policy a little bit more towards doing the right thing. Uh, I have done quite a lot of work on inequality, which is the other theme here, and I sit, in fact, at the Stone Center, which is otherwise known as the New York Office of Luxembourg Income Study, and which coordinates all of our international uh, inequality comparisons. So I know a little bit about that, but what I thought I would do um, in, just as a kind of opener here, is, is talk about what I see as the issues involving inequality in health, which are more uh, they, as, I'll, as I'll say in a second, there are some things we know, there are a few things we don't know, but there's actually quite a lot that we do know. Um, but then the question is, uh, who is we? Uh, you know, what, what do you mean we, white man? Who are, who are the people who actually know this? Has it gotten across to, to enough of the people who need to know these things? So um, let me give you four propositions about, about inequality and health that, that ought to be just part of the ground uh, you know, the, the ground truths from which everything else starts. Uh, and the first one is not about health, it's just about inequality, which is that we have seen a spectacular 
uh, explosion of inequality of, of gaps and by any measure you can use you know just raw income you can use various kinds of adjusted income you can use wealth you can use whatever measure you, you want to choose or um, the, you can look at poverty uh, whatever it is that you want to to look at the United States has seen uh, an in incredible uh, explosion uh, this is when people talk about the second gilded age that's not at all hyperbole we real, you know, insofar as we have numbers, uh, they really do look like the, the Gilded Age um, yeah, of the of the late 19th century, or even better, in some ways. Um, uh, everyone knows about uh, Thomas Piketty uh, and and his uh, his famous book, and his he likes to compare it to the Belle Epoque in, in late 19th century France, which was un unlike the U.S. Gilded Age, which was at least an immigrant society where lots of people were moving upwards, even if the society was highly unequal, we're looking, you know, more like, like uh, the uh, almost sort of uh, static, increasingly uh, uh, frozen um, class extreme society. Um, we couple that, oh, and, and, and the United States is unique among wealthy countries in the degree of inequality. It's, uh, you see a, a large increases, but not as large in some of the others, uh, Britain, has moved a significant uh, amount in our direction, Canada to some extent, but nobody else to the same extent. And we are, uh, so we're uh, unprecedented in modern history, very different uh, from anyone else in the advanced world. Um, this goes along with a generally a very threadbare social safety net. Uh, again, the United States is unique. We're unique in, in not having um, uh, uh, in particular, we're unique in not having a guaranteed, uh, um, some form of, of truly guaranteed health care. <clears throat> it's a lot better. I'm a, a you know, the, there's a glass half full, glass half empty uh, approach to the uh, Affordable Care Act. And given how hard it was to get that through, given how much good it's done for how many people, um, I, I'm a glass half full person. Uh, it's way short of where, where it should be. Uh, we're leaving large numbers of, the, lots of people fall through the cracks. The insurance is often inadequate. In many cases, insurance is not, is, you know, we, what we really want is health care, and insurance is, a, is an important part of it. But we certainly have done a lot, but still, even, even with it, and even, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm feeling a lot better about, about it uh, now than I was about a month ago, uh, because it looks as if, uh, it's, it's much more likely to survive, uh, in, at least in, in large part, than, than seemed likely not very long ago. But, uh, but it's still, even assuming that, that, we do, that the, the, uh, the improvements that we've seen since, uh, um, uh, you know, since, since 2013 uh, persist, we, re we have a uniquely threadbare safety net, un uniquely poor assurance of access to health care for much of the population. Um, then fact, and then interpretation is another question, we have enormous disparities in health outcomes by, by uh, socioeconomic status, by, by income, uh, some by race, uh, but just in general. The, the disparities in health in, uh, within in the United States are, um, they're, on a scale you don't see in any other advanced country and on a scale we didn't see here a generation ago. So there's been a, a, a huge widening of the spread with um, continuing progress in every measure that you can think of for upper part of the income distribution but not uh, further down the scale. So it has not, uh, something has happened. Something as uh, we look at, at life expectancies, uh, mortality rates, whatever you see this sort of uh, widening out that is, is a, uh, a remarkable and disturbing thing to be seeing. Um, and the last um, is that there is a, this, uh, you know, what everyone is now referring to as, uh, as Case Deaton, uh, but uh, obviously they, they, they really highlighted stuff in a way that wasn't before, but we, there's been a, um, an, a clear absolute deterioration in some crucial aspects of health for an important segment of the population. So some piece of, of the US population is actually moving backwards, which is again a remarkable thing and not something you expected to see in the 21st century. So those are the things that ought to be ground truths that everyone, we start from. Then the question, why, what, what is all that about? Should be what we're arguing about. Um, unfortunately, uh, 
you know, my, my second job in life, uh, which it involves a lot of public communication, leads to uh, the alarming discovery that things that ought not to be matters of dispute uh, all too often are <laughs> matters of dispute. And there, there's not one piece of that that, that is not the subject of, of a lot of argument. Uh, and so um, let me just say on, on the, uh, on the uh, issue of uh, just a, a widening inequality, not really the uh, subject here, uh, but it's a subject I've been working on uh, for a long time. Um, and the um, inequality denial, denial that we have a whole, whole lot of inequality, denial that it's been rising, is, a, is an industry. The whole, I mean, I guess that's the appropriate word, right? It's, uh, uh, we, we often find occasion to, uh, to quote Upton Sinclair. Uh, uh, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. Um, but the, um, uh, I wrote a paper in 1992 uh, for the American Prospect, uh, which went through all the various inequality denial arguments that were then extant uh, at the time, all the ways in which people tried to pretend it wasn't happening or it didn't matter or, and not, the paper hasn't dated at all. Every single one of those arguments is still out there, still being used. It's uh, no, 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 arg actually one thing you discover in public policy discussions is no bad argument ever goes away. Uh, they, they, they may, it may be pushed aside for a little while, but it will come back in a couple of years as soon as people have forgotten why it was shown to be such a bad argument. Um, there's, uh, on the second, um, on safety and access to health care, surely that should be obvious that, that many people in America, uh, uh, even now with the ACA in effect, and even more so beforehand, uh, did not have access, you know, could not afford the health care they needed, uh, did not have access. Uh, you would think that would be obvious. It is not. Um, there are actually examples. So, uh, you know, the old, uh, uh, okay, um, here's some, somebody saying, oh, look, there's really no lack of health care. Uh, if people really need it, they show up to the emergency room, they get care. It's not really a problem. So the question is, okay, how, how many years ago is that? When is that? Uh, and the answer is that's last month. That's, a, that's Congressman uh, Ron DeSantis talking to, uh, to Aaron Brennan on CNN. So the argument, oh, we don't have a health care problem. People can just go to the emergency room is still out there. Um, apparently aware, first of all, that you know, emergency room care is not the same thing. And secondly, that actually you know, you do get billed. Uh, if you can't pay, uh, then uh, you know, they, they will treat you anyway. Uh, but it's going to kind of screw up the rest of your life. But that the, the argument, so the, even the, the, the absence of, of full access to health care because of affordability is something that is still not fully understood out there in, in the real world of, of politics and political debate. Um, um, the disparities. Um, now that's been, there, the growing disparities in, in health by, by socioeconomic status is something that uh, a number of us have been, you know, it's been, it, I, I'm not sure quite when people really began to notice it, but, but uh, it's certainly been an, an important theme uh, since the late 1990s in, in people I talked to. And it, it shapes intelligent discussion of not just of health policy, but of a lot of other things. Uh, if you're going to be thinking about, uh, uh, you know, a lot, uh, the, the U.S. welfare state um, is disproportionately a welfare state for the elderly uh, in terms of money, not in terms of people, but in terms of money, mo most of the money does go. And then the question becomes, okay, uh, when, when do you, uh, you know, what, what age, what are the, the ages? And when, you, and when somebody is going to be pr proposing some change in, um, in the age, um, then uh, it kind of matters that life expectancy has not been rising similarly at all socioeconomic groups. So I, uh, uh, to say, uh, uh, I just, um, all right, there, there was a, a piece, uh, old teacher and colleague of mine, but anyway, Martin Feldstein had, had an article a few days ago um, about budget issues, suggesting that it's time to do a, the Greenspan Commission in the early 1980s uh, did raise the 
the age of, of full you know, eligibility for, for uh, Social Security. Um, apparently, I, I never, I've never watched The West Wing, but apparently there was some episode in which, in which President Bartlett, there's demand that he, from the right wing, that he raise the retirement age to 67, and the script writers were unaware that, in fact, we already have raised the retirement <laughs> age to 67. Um, but anyway, um, uh, so this article said that we, we should raise it another three years. Uh, because, and I'll, I'll quote, the, um, uh, the, the 83 law raised the age of eligibility for full Social Security benefits from 65 to 67. Uh, then, uh, and in, in the intervening decades, life expectancy at 67 has increased by three years, so we should raise the age gradually to 70. Okay, I thought anybody who wrote anything about retirement programs was aware that that rise in life expectancy is entirely in the top half of the income distribution. That there, are, there has been no rise in life expectancy at age 65 uh, for workers who, who are, you know, the, the essentially um, the, the initial rise in the retirement age um, has, was fully eaten, uh, eaten uh, sorry, the, um, the rise in the retirement age from 65 to 67 roughly matched the rise in life expectancy for the lower half of, of, of the income distribution. Uh, there has been no further rise, um, but apparently it's not out there. People are unaware that, that rising life expectancy is not a thing. It's not that Americans have a rising life exper expectancy. It's that some Americans do and, and others, uh, uh, a large fraction, do not. Um, and that's, again, it's showing something is, is uh, we're, we're not getting some very, very basic ground facts across. Um, the stuff that is really um, where I think there are, there are real questions uh, involves the, these spectacular mortality increases among certain groups. And, and, um, and, I, and I think that's part of a broader issue. So let me, uh, what we know is that we have a highly unequal society that has become more unequal. We know that we have highly unequal access to health care. Uh, which is a, a product, I mean, it's in part because people's incomes are unequal and people, some people have jobs that come with good coverage and others do not, but is very largely a policy choice because other countries can, uh, can and do provide guaranteed access. Um, we know that we have rising disparities uh, in, in health outcomes, uh, dramatically so by socioeconomic status. Um, we don't exactly know um, why that last part is happening. We don't know why, uh, um, is, it, is, it, um, uh, it, is inequality per se a cause of rising mortality? Is it, uh, is it that there are new medical, improved medical science that is only available to those who can pay? Uh, you can tell various stories. And, um, there have been various books over the years, uh, various uh, studies claiming that uh, inequality is per se uh, unhealthy, that it has adverse effects, that it's uh, uh, the spirit level, famously the book. Um, uh, I have occasionally expressed sympathy for that. Uh, Angus Deaton uh, yelled at me because uh, he doesn't he doesn't agree uh, he doesn't think the evidence is solid and I think that it's probably the case that we don't know uh, well enough whether that's true um, it's hard I would say looking at the case Deaton type thing and I'm, I know I'm being terribly unfair to other researchers who have found other things but haven't found quite that you know they, they sold it quite but anyway what the the actual declining life expectancy rising mortality among certain groups it's hard not to have a sense that that is somehow going along with a combination of rising inequality with declining social mobility i mean I, uh, as case indeed can say deaths of despair that something has gone terribly wrong and that um now is that part of a, a general phenomenon is inequality just a really really bad thing for for quality of life, for people's morale, might be, might not be. Uh, I'll give you a principle that I've I've laid out in a completely different, completely different, but not that unrelated context. Also, an inequality issue, um, parallel to your discussion here about inequality in health. There's been a lot of discussion about inequality in economic growth. 
and um, ma many, many, many conferences now about uh, does, uh, um, does inequality help or hurt economic growth? Does do measures to redistribute income, uh, to reduce inequality, are they bad for growth? Are they good for growth? And there's a classic argument that says that um, trying to reduce inequality with higher taxes and stronger social programs reduces incentives, and therefore it's going to make your economy a little bit poorer, but it might be worth it. It's the, the leaky bucket argument as you transfer stuff. But then there's a, a fair bit now of, of evidence uh, uh, suggesting that at least at least some programs the other way around. There's actually now really quite strong evidence that uh, that food stamps and Medicaid uh, are, are pro-growth policies because the children who've had adequate nutrition and health care grow up to be more productive adults. Is this true more generally? And um, if you uh, if you want to run enough regressions with enough countries, and you you can always find a regression that will tell you what you want to hear. Uh, here, my my uh, my principle on this stuff has been: don't be greedy. If you think inequality is a really bad thing, then you should be satisfied with the result that says that there is zero evidence that attempting to reduce inequality from the levels currently prevailing in the United States will hurt economic growth. There's some reason to think it might help, maybe, but you don't. Your argument shouldn't rest on that. Your argument should rest on this is something good we can do it can make a lot of people's lives better, and it doesn't appear to have any cost. Um, I suspect that there's something similar to be said on health as well. Uh, is an, an unequal society an inherently unhealthy society in a lot of ways? My guess is yes, but I don't know that. And, but I don't need that to say that, that we know that we could do enormous amounts to improve the health status of, of the less fortunate members of our society, uh, and we should go ahead and do it. Um, and the problem then, and I'll conclude here, is how do we... Uh, uh, what we have here, uh, what we have here is a, is, is a failure to communicate. That that's the what's amazing is how little of. I mean, there are hard questions. These questions, are questions of, of uh, if you like, questions about uh, trying to understand deaths of despair or just uh, those are hard questions, and mu and research should continue. But there are a lot of things where there are really easy answers. We really do know what to do. We have the we have the the evidence, the the tools, the policy. Uh, uh, mechanisms. What we ha uh, don't have the votes in Congress, obviously, at least not at this point. But but we don't even have the public discourse, having gotten to the point of understanding the things that everybody should understand. And so the question, which I'm not going to help you answer, is how do we do that? Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you. That was great. Um, before we get to our next speaker, I had a couple of thank yous that I wanted to do. I want to thank uh, Lon Kaufman, our provost, uh, for helping to host us here. Uh, I wanted to thank the Roosevelt House staff, particularly Harold Holzer and Rafael Munoz, for helping set this up. Uh, I want to give a giant thank you to The Lancet for um, inviting us to curate this special issue and for supporting uh, this and a couple of other conferences as well to publicize this. Uh, Rebecca Cooney, our North American editor, uh, really had her fingerprints all over this. She was involved from the very start of this project and has given us some excellent guidance along with her colleagues. Uh, and Erin Van Dorn, who's here too, took this fabulous photograph of Lady Liberty, uh, looking a little bit sad. Um, Finally, I, I do want to thank Harvard Center for Primary Care that has also been sponsoring these conferences. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Mary Bassett. And uh, Mary is Commissioner of Health for the City of New York. She's had that job since 2014. She's originally from New York City. Uh, in fact, she's from Harlem. Uh, she lived in Zimbabwe for nearly 20 years, and she was previously the program director, a program director at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Uh, her background is she received her BA in history from Harvard College, her MD from Columbia University uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. She served as a medical resident at Harlem Hospital Center, not very far from here. She also has a master's in public health from the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Mary Bassett. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, 
And it's a real pleasure to follow Paul Krugman, uh, who is both an academic and a journalist. Uh, he was one of the early vo public voices, uh, lending prestige and insight to the importance of single payer. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, our mayor, Mayor Bill de Blasio, is on the record twice as endorsing single payer. So I hope that we have a growing uh, discourse about that. And of course, I want to thank uh, David uh, Himmelstein and Steffi Woolhandler, who, who curated and really promoted and championed the, the special issue of The Lancet. I don't know if there are copies around, but it really is well worth uh, reading. Uh, there are five uh, different articles. They are across a whole span of ideas, and I'm going to be talking about the one that was written, first authored by a junior researcher, one of the features of this special issue at uh, the health department, for which I'm the senior author. And I'm going to be talking about structural racism, uh, which is uh, often sort of viewed as a subset of economic inequality, but I'm going to make the case to you that it is an independent uh, set of relationships in our society, one dating back to the founding of our country, one that has a huge impact on the health of our population. We just all met upstairs in the room that I'm told was where the Social Security um, legislation was formulated. Uh, all of us know that this transformed uh, this country, changed lives and livelihoods for older Americans, and I hope you all know, excluded largely Afri the African-American population because it excluded farm workers and domestic workers uh, from that initial legislation. So I'm going to be using the same slides that I used up at Harvard. So those of you who witnessed that online or in person will have seen these already. Uh, and I'm going to use the first part of my talk to sort of summarize what we get at in the article, uh, which seeks to look at about the impact of structural racism on health and then I want to turn to things that we're doing at the health department um, that I, because I think very often people find that like income inequality, structural racism is too deep, too far. Uh, our work as public health practitioners is just too limited to tackle these issues. So I want to try and leave you with the idea that we are seeking to tackle these issues and some of the ways that we are doing it. This is a graph uh, from a paper written by Nancy Krieger and colleagues that was quoted in, I believe, three of the five articles. Um, and it shows a premature mortality, which is uh, death before the age of 65, uh, by both income and race. The solid lines up above uh, you are people of color who, for much of the 20th century, were largely people of African descent uh, who were brought here uh, and descended from enslaved Africans in this country, and the bottom dotted lines are, uh, are people who are classified as whites. Uh, the, this is the highest income group, this pink, and I have put this circle here to show you when the highest income group among people of color uh, matched the premature mortality rates uh, of the uh, lowest income group among whites, and that was in about 1990. Uh, the uh, other thing to note about this slide is that beginning in the mid-60s, uh, a period of um, a whole host of progressive legislation being passed, uh, public health insurance, environmental protection, um, uh, and so on, the curve clearly uh, became steeper in terms of decline. It's been declining for all groups. But you can see here something after 1980, uh, that decline leveled off uh, uh, among both, uh, particularly among people of color. Um, but uh, a lot can be said about this graph, uh, but I think that it demonstrates both the uh, impact of social policy on seemingly immutable things like premature mortality uh, with the change in slope and the enduring significance of race in our society. Uh, which has meant that until very recently, people of color all could expect to leave shorter li live shorter lives. And that is why we thought it would be important to use the opportunity that uh, Drs. Himmelstein and Will Handler created uh, in, and the Lancet uh, shared its pages for to talk about the, the impact of racism in the United States. And 
when we decided how to think about racism, we thought we would focus in particular on structural racism. And not all of you may be familiar with the taxonomy that we use um, in discussing the ways in which racism works. And it's often divided into four kinds of, uh, of um, experiences of racism or phenomenon of racism. One is internalized, the next interpersonal, uh, institutional, I think most of you are probably familiar with that phrase. And structural racism, I would argue, is foundational to all of these and represents the supra-institutional phenomenon that connect historically and contemporaneously the, um, the uh, fact that race operates in a whole, uh, uh, all, whole range of places, in ability to get bank credit, ability to get jobs, ability to get uh, education, um, and so on, and that these together reinforce all the other forms of racism. The best example, I think, the most heart-wrenching and poignant one of internal racism is uh, the uh, experiment done and was used in the Board of Brown versus the Board of Education uh, legal uh, suit that led to the desegregation of, uh, of uh, schools in the United States in which uh, black children were asked to pick the doll that was the best doll, the smartest doll, the nicest doll, and the vast majority of black children picked the white doll. For interpersonal racism, uh, we have lots of examples of that in clinical care. Uh, the fact that blacks are less likely, even as children, to be adequately medicated for pain, less likely to have certain diagnoses made. I, I thought I would show this one that was brought to my attention by David Williams, who's on the faculty at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, which uh, shows that if you're black and in a crosswalk, there's a, the, the driver is sevenfold less likely to s not to stop. Uh, they are more likely to carry on through that crosswalk. Obviously, uh, 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 a perception of who's in the crosswalk and who you should stop for. Now I'm going to turn to some maps, which we use a lot in public health, but this is not a map of diseases. Uh, this is a map, the one on your right, was put together from, um, from a series of handwritten maps that were developed uh, during the New Deal period when government was getting in the business of promoting home ownership and uh, promoting the making of mortgages through a homeowner's loan uh, program. Uh, this is uh, a computerized version that put them all together, and you can see that New York City, I, was, I showed this last in Boston, um, you know, had hardly any that were classed as best investments. You had to be up in Westchester, more or less, to get that, but, um, but there were uh, large swaths of the city that were considered hazardous investments, and these are, this really formed a foundation for the residential segregation that remains with us to this day. This is the phenomenon known as redlining. And these are the neighborhoods uh, in New York City uh, which uh, over are, are the descendants of the whole phenomenon of redlining. Uh, New York City is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. It, um, it, it, if you use this measure that the census uses, this shows the black-white dissimilarity index uh, and anything above 0.6 is considered high in New York City. Uh, it's uh, above 0.8. What that means is that 80% of blacks or whites would have to move to get even distribution uh, by race across the, the city. Uh, leaving aside whether people want to live evenly distributed, uh, this suggests that we have a, a very uh, highly segregated city. And of course, in our city, race and income run parallel, uh, that to be black or Latino is to be poor, and to be poor, by and large, is to be black or Latino. And we recently had Brian Smedley um, come visit to the department and uh, give a talk, and he pointed out uh, the best way to capture it is that if you, are ha if you have to be a poor child, it's best to be a poor white child, because you're much less likely to live in a poor neighborhood. And it, when you live in a poor neighborhood, not only do you have to confront the lack of family resources, uh, you have to confront a neighborhood that lacks resources so that 
um, it refers to good schools, safe parks, safe streets, uh, being able to buy good, healthy food, uh, so that a, a black child is much more likely to live in a neighborhood that lacks these neighborhood level resources. These don't belong to an individual. They're not determined by an individual. They're determined by a neighborhood. And this is another way in which uh, residential segregation uh, perpetuates uh, the phenomenon of, um, of poverty across generations. So residential segregation is probably the best example uh, that we have of, um, of how structural racism works. And that's why place-based approaches that um, target housing are probably among the most promising strategies with which to tackle uh, the impact of structural racism. Unfortunately, they fairly uh, rarely uh, have published on health outcomes. Uh, so we have one in New York City. Uh, this is not for uh, people who are eligible for NYCHA housing, but people who are eligible for subsidized housing developed by either commercial or nonprofit housing developers by the Housing Preservation and Development, uh, or HPD, in our city. If you're eligible, you get um, uh, to enter a lottery. And if you win that lottery, unlike some other experiments where you get a voucher, which you can try to use to go find an apartment, in the New York City lottery, when you win the lottery, you get an apartment. So this was used as a random experiment. Uh, and they have uh, presented their data in, um, in abstract form. I don't know what we're going to do to help them publish it, uh, but uh, it shows lower rates of depression, lower rates of asthma, uh, lower rates of diabetes among people who su were successfully successful in the in the lottery. Uh, so that getting a better apartment, uh, possibly in a quote better neighborhood, uh, had a num numerous health outcomes. The more interesting ones are ones like the um, East Lake Community Project in Atlanta, where they did a whole host of interventions across jobs, uh, across housing, and they showed huge impacts in terms of numbers of social outcomes, but we don't have the health impact data from these uh, studies yet. But uh, we thought that we would still uh, try and build on some of the assets that the department has in neighborhoods, and I'm going to turn now to some of the work that the department is doing to try and address structural racism, both in our programmatic activities and how we function as a, as a city agency internally. Uh, this is a picture from uh, the LaGuardia era in New York City. Uh, this was uh, the East Harlem Health Center was the first uh, health department neighborhood office. It was an, actually initially established right after World War I with private funding. And then LaGuardia uh, was convinced of its utility because infant mortality rate in this then largely immigrant Italian neighborhood fell by half uh, over the period compared to other poor parts of the city. He decided to build these district health centers all over the city. And they focused on initially mostly infant health, um, but they then uh, moved on. Here you can see the picture of a baby being weighed. They moved on to focus on chronic diseases. And when I was a deputy commissioner at the health department, a uh, position I held during the Bloomberg administration, we decided that we would identify communities in the city that had uh, especially high excess burden of disease. These were in the South Bronx, East and Central Harlem, and in Central Brooklyn. And these areas ho targeted here uh, were uh, communities to which we deployed health department staff to be based full time. Uh, so no longer using the model of field staff going out, coming back to headquarters. These were people who worked out of district offices, uh, worked with local institutions, and sought to deliver more intensively the programmatic services, especially our costly ones, newborn home visiting, uh, ones that um, required more people power would be targeted to these communities uh, rather than trying to spread them all over the city. And when I came back to the health department, I wanted to see whether we were in the right neighborhoods. Everybody says East Harlem, for example, which is not too far to the north from here, is gentrifying rapidly. 
maybe it's not the right place to be focused on. And uh, this, uh, this graph shows the three neighborhoods. Um, and uh, happily, although I suspect this was citywide, not just for these neighborhoods, a decline in premature mortality uh, in these neighborhoods. But they were still the highest, um, highest uh, rates of premature mortality in the city. So they remain the areas for us to work in. And we have proceeded to leverage the space that we have in buildings that the health department owns in these neighborhoods to invite community-based organizations to join us so that we are co-located under a single roof. This includes clinical services, dental care, uh, primary health care, as well as services that are offered by other city agencies and by um, uh, giving office space to people who work out in the community uh, the price of entry is an agreement to work collaboratively on identifying shared goals. Um, so we're seeking to implement a collective impact model. Uh, so these are just some of the, um, of the um, organizations that have joined with the health department in co-locating in these buildings. Our biggest building is in East Harlem. That was 55,000 square feet. We just launched uh, a couple weeks ago. But we, we're, we have seven of these buildings, uh, three of which have been launched with, uh, with funding from the administration. And we have gotten some political support, uh, and uh, that's the speaker, Melissa Marcia Verita, who represents East Harlem, uh, and uh, are very hopeful about this activity. Uh, I wonder whether I should just really, because uh, I, I haven't been keeping track of time. Who's keeping track of time? I have five minutes remaining. This was just a study to, um, to show how we are now thinking about neighborhoods and race in all aspects of our work. Uh, this is um, our emergency preparedness work. These black dots are all of the places where we would dispense antibiotics in the event of an anthrax attack or something. And we started looking at this data more carefully. Uh, we were really pleased two-thirds of places could be staffed. Um, but you can see these are people coming, these lines are their commuting lines. And when we consider um, trying to get people who live within three miles, which is sort of reasonable to ask people to walk, we started seeing these, this hash mark here are places that had zero. This is the South Bronx. We started seeing problems emerge. Uh, the reason uh, to think about having people who live closer is really sensible during, after 9-11, uh, all of the highways were closed. And it turns out that we have a plan that's not equitable uh, because we couldn't actually have people walk to these places from, uh, from where they live. Uh, so we would have many places, and this is the South Bronx, that would be at risk. And our poor neighborhoods in the city uh, were far more likely, 42%, than uh, uh, low poverty neighborhoods to be uh, underserved. And this is really only because of where the health department staff live. So we had no problem at Park Slope, Upper West Side. We had a lot of trouble. Um, and this is where the management lives. I should make clear that this was looking at uh, who would be the managerial staff for these. So this is an example of some of the things that we've identified by using this lens. Uh, to uh, evaluate our work that we wouldn't have identified if we hadn't begun to become a more race-conscious um, organization. And we're working on this internally with uh, an effort called Race to Justice. Our uh, staff is all being trained. The senior leadership, I can't say that they're really, really happy about this, but they're about to spend a full day in training tomorrow. Um, uh, reviewing, um, uh, going over uh, it, um, uh, issues like implicit bias uh, and becoming a much more race conscious and I hope anti-racist institution. Uh, we are working on this wholeheartedly and I uh, am deeply committed to it uh, because I think that one of the phenomena of racism in our society uh, and the silence that surrounds its discussion is that we fail to, uh, to become critical thinkers of the notion of color blindness. And that makes us blind to the ongoing phenomenon of white supremacy. So this is real 
um, sort of practical work. Uh, we're looking at how we spend money, where we spend it, who we contract with, uh, who we hire, and uh, all, as well as how we communicate. Um, so all of this work is work that I'm doing with a wonderful leadership team. I want to acknowledge Lillian Barrios Paoli, who was uh, my deputy mayor at the time that I became commissioner and was with me as I assembled this team that's the most diverse team that the Department of Health has ever seen. When I joined, there was not a single black or Latino member of the health department senior team. We are now very diverse, as you can see, and we even, as I like to point out, improved our gender balance. We added some men. Uh, so <laughs> I want to um, stop there and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, thanks. Well, she certainly um, seemed to affirm what Paul Krugman said, that there's things we know we can do. So um, next speaker is David Himmelstein, who um, with me was one of the co-editors uh, of the Lancet series, co-curators. Uh, David is professor of public health at the City University of New York. He's a lecturer in medicine at Harvard Medical School, where he was previously a professor. He's a staff physician and adjunct clinical professor of medicine at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, actually in the, the South Bronx. And we do live four miles away from where we work, so we would, we would be big zeros in your slide. Um, David uh, graduated from, I was also a native New Yorker. He graduated from Columbia University's College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, he did a fellowship at Harvard Medical School and practiced primary care internal medicine in public hospitals, uh, public hospital in Cambridge for 28 years. Um, he co-founded Physicians for a National Health Program, whose 20,000 members advocate for nonprofit single-payer national health insurance. Uh, and he and I, as I said, were co-curators of the Lancet series. David Himmelstein. I always wonder, worry about how I'm going to be introduced, especially when my spouse introduces me. You know, Eleanor Roosevelt, many years ago, was speaking in Maine and um, was said to have, have been asked by the woman who's going to introduce her, how do you want to be introduced? And she said, please make it brief. I hate those long introductions. And the woman said, this is Eleanor Roosevelt, and the less said about her, the better. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I guess my task here is to show you this, this uh, in slides what Paul Krugman really spoke about. Um, when I first went to Harvard, the, my department chair said, an expert is anyone who comes from out of town and brings along slides. Uh, so I, I felt, even though I was coming from in town, I should. Uh, and the other piece of advice, by the way, was that you should end every talk with a quote from Winston Churchill. So um, when you hear me quoting Churchill, you'll know that I'm done. Um, so th this is the, the fundamental point uh, of my talk from, from the Pope of all people, an odd person to be quoting as an atheist Jew. Uh, just as the commandment, thou shalt not kill, sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life, today we also have to say thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality such an economy, such an economy kills. Um, well, uh, as, as um, Paul said uh, we've had sharply diverging incomes. This is one measure of the economic inequality. So each of these lines represents a fifth of the population going from poorest to richest at the, uh, from bottom to top. And you see that the line for the richest group has been just sprinting away from the rest of the society. And if you um, divided it not in fifths but in uh, finer grains, the top 1% would be going uh, off the top even faster. Um, and w we also have extraordinary inequalities in the utilization of health care. So on the left here, again, each of these bars representing 20% of the population going from poor to rich uh, within each group of bars. The left is the situation in the year 2000 where the wealthy, the blue bar on your right, got somewhat less in the way of health care than the poor. Now, they should be getting much less because the wealthy are in fact much healthier than the poor. 
Um, but the right-hand uh, set of bars is the more recent data, and that shows, again, the really striking redistribution of care towards the wealthy from the poorer in our society. Um, and as Mary said, the, the divisions are not just economic divisions. Here's the incomes of blacks, the lower yellow bar uh, line, and whites through the last several decades. And we've not seen an equalization in the striking income inequality uh, according to race. And black Americans continue to, to, to die far younger than their white Anglo counterparts. And while Case and Deaton's essay has pointed out the very disturbing trends among uh, poorly educated middle-aged white folks, it remains true that their death rates uh, are still substantially lower than comparable uh, African Americans. Um, the gap in life expectancy, as Paul said, has been growing very substantially. Here's the uh, remaining expected life at the age of 50. For people who turned 50 in 1980 on your left and who turned 50 in 2010 on your right. And again, that blue bar is sprinting ahead, uh, not just in income, but here in life expectancy. Uh, and as he noted, the life expectancy for the poorest actually has declined uh, among people uh, at the age of 50 in, in the recent period. And um, again, following up something that Paul said, uh, we've not seen a similar phenomena in several other countries. Uh, the most recent data we have from Canada shows a little bit of flattening in the period um, in Canada. Uh, on your left, 1991, on your right, 2006, and you see that the slope of the difference between poor and rich has been getting a little bit flatter. They've certainly not flattened out entirely, but it is somewhat flatter. Uh, we trail overall life expectancy uh, to other nations, and in um, these international slides, I've generally put the U.S. in yellow. So. Our life expectancy, about three to four years shorter than other nations, our infant mortality rate much higher than other nations, and our maternal mortality um, strikingly high. And we recently had an unprecedented increase in maternal mortality in this country, most strikingly in Texas. And one wonders whether the, the uh, withdrawal of, of uh, reproductive services in Texas uh, is causally linked. We are not sure of that, but certainly we suspect it. Uh, this in the context that two-thirds of our health spending in this country is tax-funded. So we're used to thinking our, of our health care system as a private health care system, but in fact, if we add up all of the pieces that government spends on health care, fully two-thirds of our total health spending comes from government. Now, I've put in this slide not just Medicare and Medicaid and the VA, the sort of traditional public things, but the huge tax subsidies for private insurance that in fact go largely to the wealthy, uh, as well as public employees coverage paid for by government. And our public spending is now more than total spending per person than any other nation except Switzerland. So we spend more than Canada does on its entire healthcare system in public dollars. Uh, it's not that Americans get so much health care that causes our costs to be high. We visit the doctor less frequently than many other countries. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time in the hospital. In fact, uh, we don't get a lot of different, many different kinds of care. What we get an extraordinary amount of is insurance overhead. So every man, woman, and child pays about $800 that stays with our insurance companies each year. In effect, our health policy has been rationing a surplus. We have an enormous amount of unnecessary care while we're denying care to, to thousands, indeed millions, of Americans. And um, it takes a good deal of effort to keep sick patients away from idle doctors and empty hospital beds. The blue on this slide is the number of bureaucrats employed in our healthcare system, and the yellow is the number of physicians. Um, by far the fastest growing element in our healthcare system. Um, as Paul said, we've had a sharp drop in the number of people uninsured, and yet we still have 28 million Americans who have no health insurance coverage. And even if the 
all of the states had accepted the Medicaid expansion, we would still have 23 million uninsured today. So we have a great deal left to do. I'm more in the glass half empty category, uh, but certainly the glass is partly at least full. Um, we still have, have great disparities in who is uninsured. You see that among Native Americans, 20% nearly uninsured, uh, and 11% uh, of blacks, 16% of Hispanics. Um, the Affordable Care Act did reduce the number of Americans who say they're unable to afford care, um, and that certainly has been great progress. This is data from the National Health Interview Survey, um, but we have much left to do. We have much of the new coverage that comes with enormous deductibles, so within the exchange plans. On your left, the exchange bronze plans under Obamacare carry an average deductible of $5,700. The silver plans an average deductible of $3,000. And employer-based coverage, about $1,500. And um, if one looks at what are the savings available for people to actually pay for these deductibles, um, about 30% of Americans would be bankrupted by their deductible before they were eligible for care under their insurance. Um, some work that we did a number of years ago with a then colleague at Harvard Law School, now a U.S. Senator, Elizabeth Warren, we surveyed uh, uh, people in bankruptcy courts around the country and found that about 60% of bankruptcies had at least a, a major medical cause. And uh, when we broke down what kind of insurance the medically bankrupt had, 60% of them had private coverage, at least when they first got sick. So we have insurance that often provides little real protection. And does that really matter? Well, we know from good studies that when people have heart attacks, if they're uninsured, they're about 38% less likely to get to the hospital in a prompt fashion. And if they're underinsured, if they worry about their medical bills, they're about 21% less likely to get to the hospital in a hurry. And that really means unnecessary deaths. I'm going to turn very briefly to the Affordable Care Act and a, a bit more about it. The Lancet on its cover when the act was passed said, the health care reform process exposes how corporate influence renders the U.S. government incapable of making policy on the basis of evidence and the public interest. Um, we, we got a plan that I would characterize as a mandate model for reform. Um, and why do I have Richard Nixon's picture and the Heritage Foundation on here? Um, I would say that this is at the root of why the Republicans have faced such an enormous dilemma. The only idea for how to expand coverage that has ever come from the Republicans was in fact taken up by President Obama as his plan. Um, it's an expanded Medicaid-like program for the poor with mandated purchase of coverage and insurance exchanges. A lot of people have trouble believing it. I have a, a brief video, if we could just show it uh, here, that I think helps explain why I say this is Nixon's President plan. President Nixon today pledged his administration to a new national health plan that would benefit not only patients, but also doctors and citizens who enjoy good health. But beating him to the punch, Senator Edward Kennedy earlier proposed an alternate plan that goes much further than the administration. I am proposing today a new national health strategy. It helps more people pay for care, but it also expands the supply of health services and makes them more efficient. It emphasizes keeping people well, not just making people well. The president's program, as uh, announced it today, as a national health partnership program, uh, I believe is really a partnership program that will provide uh, billions of dollars to the health insurance companies. It's really a partnership between the administration and the insurance companies. It's not a partnership between the patients and the doctors uh, in this nation. The administration proposal would provide different plans for four categories of Americans. For 150 million working people and their families, employers would be required to buy health insurance providing a basic package of benefits, eventually they paying three-quarters of the premiums. For some 20 million of the working poor and their families, the current free Medicaid services would be replaced by private health insurance fully paid by the government for the poorest with a sliding scale of contributions for families earning more than $3,000. 
For the 21 million aging Americans, the $5.60 monthly Medicare premium for optional doctor services would be dropped, Social Security taxes adjusted to make up the cost. For some 30 million domestic, self-employed, and others, lower cost by being enabled to buy policies at group rates from insurance pools. So um, that, that was the Nixon plan. Um, the Heritage Foundation later refined it a, a bit. Um, and this is what we got. This is a, a simple schematic of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and you'll notice the Republican plan at the right got, get sick and die penniless. Um, well, um, this is the, the software that was used when Medicare was implemented, our single-payer program for the elderly. Uh, Harry Truman, of course, the first Medicare enrollee. They enrolled, um, what, 19 million seniors within 11 months of the passage of that program, it was up and running without any of the glitches that we experienced with the ACA, not because of incompetence, but because of complexity. Um, Canada, at the time we passed our Medicare and Medicaid, passed its national health insurance program, which is essentially a Medicare for all uh, approach, but with first dollar coverage without the deductibles and co-payments that we have in Medicare. And as you see, their costs have really flattened out uh, since they passed their program, uh, used to be as much as ours. Um, the uh, uh, point of this slide is that Canada actually has an appropriate utilization pattern of care with the poor on the left of the Canada panel getting more care than the rich and uh, the U.S. pattern on the right. Uh, their infant mortality rate that was higher than ours quickly fell below ours and has remained that. Um, Canadian doctors aren't starving, by the way. They, they make a reasonable income. Um, these are can, uh, Canadian dollars, but I think most of us could get by on this. Um, and um, about half of the difference in health spending between our two nations is the bureaucratic costs of U.S. health care. Uh, so we're spending about $2,600 for every man, woman, and child on bureaucracy that essentially enforces inequality and extracts profits in our healthcare system. Um, Mass General Hospital, 150, uh, I'm sorry, 350 full-time equivalent people in its billing department. Toronto General Hospital, when we visited there, three people in its billing department, whose job was to send bills to Americans who wandered across the border. <laughs> and um, doctors are, are similarly uh, less burdened in Canada. Um, if we ask Americans, what do you favor? This is the Gallup organization last year. Do you favor replacing the ACA with a federally funded system for all? And 58% of people support that in that poll. Uh, not surprisingly, the vast majority of Democrats. This is the more surprising piece, that among Republicans, 41% said they would support it. And among the, those favoring repeal of the ACA, a majority said they would support it. And um, this slide pre prepared by Jacob Bohr, one of the uh, Lancet co-authors actually, looking at um, the, ca the counties that voted for Donald Trump and the change in life expectancy over the last 30 years in those counties. And the point here is that the, there is a very strong relationship between declining health and willingness to vote or at least voting for Donald Trump in large numbers. Um, so uh, inequality may have political consequences as well. And I just end with the uh, Republican plan. It says our health insurance is being replaced by a series of tweets calling us losers. Um, I guess Winston Churchill said years ago that one could always rely on Americans to do the right thing after they have exhausted every other possibility. So thank you very much. Hi, I'd like each of our speakers to come up, and uh, Lillian barrios Pioli is going to lead a moderated discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so before I ask you some questions, I would like to ask if you have questions of each other. Uh, well, David, um, I, I, well, this is really asking you to speculate, which you may not want to do. Um, but it seems to me that one of the problems that we face with, um, with entitlements is a perception that the people who get entitlements are not the people who are deserving of them. 
and that that's often colored by by perceptions of uh, by race. Um, so I it just it, it's interesting to me that um, in, that the, that the conversation of income inequality just continues to go on largely without a conversation about race, uh, and I wonder if you have any thought about that since I'm here and I'm talking about race a lot. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so, okay, political economy point. Um, if we ask why is America different, you know, why, uh, why do we have so much less of a, of a social safety net in general? Why don't we have guaranteed? Um, the answer is race. It's all race. I mean, it, um, the um, little known history, why didn't we, uh, why didn't we get um, Medicare for all in 1947? You know, they, 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 Truman tried, and it looked it looked quite likely at the time, and it was defeated by a, a sort of unholy coalition of the American Medical Association, which thought that that would lead to lower incomes for doctors. Little did they know that what Medicare was going to do for them when it finally came, um, and Southern politicians who were afraid that it would lead to integrated hospitals. Uh, correctly, when Medicare came in, one of the things it did was to force integration of hospitals. So. Races and, and everything. If you try to understand the American difference on politics, it always ends up coming back to race. So it, it's it's central. Now, what's a little peculiar, I think, and it, and in some ways, uh, um, the when I try to understand, I, I think these, this actually in a way it gets at some of Davis. I I've been for some reason uh, a little bit obsessed with West Virginia lately as a. Uh, uh, as as an interesting case, because West Virginia, poor state, um, very extremely dependent upon federal programs, um, and in fact has benefited enormously from Obamacare, but it has benefited mainly from the single payer part of Obamacare. It's 27% uh, of the population is now on Medicaid, and um, and so it's and it you know and if you ask about what the economy is in West Virginia. Uh, there are essentially no coal miners, even in West Virginia, but 15% of the workforce is in health and human services, which is all being supported by Medicare and Medicaid. And it voted three to one for Trump. Oh, and, oh, and, and there are essentially no black people. So what is, how, how are we supposed to make, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but this is, it's not a simple, if there's a race element here, it's not a simple one, it's not as simple as, people see that the people who are getting government benefits are people who don't look like them because in West Virginia everybody looks like them and everybody gets government benefits and yet somehow they think that 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 government is their enemy. The other part about this that I think is that very often people look at the terrible US health system and they aren't careful compared to other wealthy nations. Uh, they think it's because, well, we don't look like Switzerland, right? Uh, we are a diverse country, which is really code for saying that if we didn't have these terrible health outcomes among people of color, our, our real Americans would look okay. But the data don't support that either. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. white population ranks at or near the bottom for any number of health outcomes uh, across the lifespan until you reach... Uh, you know, over 75 years of age when we, we see an advantage of, compared to uh, our peer nations. So this notion that our health outcomes are driven by the bad health outcomes among people of color is not accurate. Just to say, the, both on health outcomes, uh, I do a little bit, the international comparisons, part of the course I teach, and um, and you know, income obviously matters for both health outcomes and life satisfaction, but some other things matter. And, and the one overwhelming thing that stands out is it appears to be a really good thing to be Hispanic. Uh, life satisfaction, health outcomes are just way better than you would expect from income, both, both for Hispanic countries and for Hispanics within the United States. That I didn't know, so I've just learned something. And, and within the U.S., at least part of that is what's what's known as the healthy immigrant effect. That, in order to to make it across the border, in many circumstances, you you have to be quite fit. And, and a little bit of self selection and the age also. You have a lot of you know yeah. many many young people. Yeah. So okay. So um, did did you want to say anything else, or should I judge, jump into? 
Okay, one of the things that struck me in the conversation was um, what Mary pointed out about housing and uh, the importance of housing in health. And we know that in New York City, we have a record number of homeless families and homeless single people at the same time. And most people, you know, don't have ideal uh, housing uh, to begin with. Um, and many people are precariously housed. They, they are living, you know, just with a sense that they may be evicted at any point. So how do you see health interventions having something to do with this in poor neighborhoods particularly? Well, I, I think you said it. Doesn't fall directly under the health department. So, uh, but certainly the crisis in access to affordable housing is uh, is also contributes to a health crisis. And uh, I was thinking actually after the election of Bill De Blasio that he had they had these young people out on the streets with tablets, very modern, uh, saying, "What are your priorities? Is it housing, uh, jobs, health?" And there was a fourth. And you know, of course, I'm really committed to health, but I wasn't sure what I would, should tick, because I, I, I decided I would tick housing. So uh, I think that uh, that that this is be, this is truly a public health issue, uh, one that so far we haven't turned the tide on. In my introductory um, health policy course, which is largely about the medical care system, in the in the first class. Um, I say to the students, we're going to talk about the third most important piece of health throughout this class, and the third most important determinant. Um, the most important is the standard of living. If people don't have a reasonable standard of living, medical care really is, is just picking up the crumbs. And the second is public health measures, clean, clean water, clean air, access to, to um, exercise and that sort of thing. So um, that's clearly true. On the other hand, I would say that our healthcare financing system actually reinforces the other problems um, that we face in our society. So among poorer people, they're spending an enormous amount of their incomes towards medical care, and the wealthy are spending a trivial parts of, of their income on medical care. So that um, I've long been an, an advocate of first dollar single payer coverage, and that involves a substantial redistribution of income. And frankly, that's the biggest political problem with it other than perhaps the assault on the insurance and, and pharmaceutical industries. But we would really, with a, a reasonable health program, um, redistribute many tens of billions of dollars downwards towards the poorest families. Actually, I have a, it's kind of a question for David, um, though maybe I'm, I'm gonna give part of my own answer. Do you see a path to single payer? Because I, you know, I, I, on, on, the, on the merits, I've always been, Single payer, uh, but I, you know, I, I went signed on for for the system we got because I thought it was what we could get, and hope that maybe there's an eventual route from from here to there. Do you see how would you get there, given some, you know, uh, not totally cynical, but but not at all utopian vision of how the U.S. political process might work. That's. Yeah, or New, New York, where there's a single payer bill in the legislature that currently is within one vote in the Senate of, of having a majority in both houses. Um, so I, I guess my answer to that, Paul, is th that I'm not sure what the route is. What I can tell you is that we've made social progress in past years on many important issues from very unexpected efforts, and that. The more people are pushing in the more places, the more likely it is that we actually make a breakthrough. So, you know, Rosa Parks was one of, of thousands of people um, taking action in the civil rights movement and um, was not a particularly distinct person from many others who were doing similar things, but hers was the action that triggered advance. So uh, I think we can move on many fronts. I would love to see the op-ed pages of the New York Times be one of those. Uh, we'll, we'll have... Uh, or more so even in the future. We'll, we'll have a, a bill introduced in the Senate by Senator Sanders next week with um, several Senate sponsors, which we've not had in the past. We've now up to, I guess, 108 sponsors to the single-payer bill in the House of Representatives, which is the most ever. And I think, frankly, the Democrats are beginning to understand that 
this is an issue which, far from being defensive of the status quo, which clearly was an advance, um, they can they can have a, a very positive, forward-looking um, program on. And um, I think we can make progress at the states. I think it's very problematic to implement a, a full single-payer single, single payer program in an individual state like New York with border crossing and the need for federal waivers to do things. But I think we could make substantial progress and show progress to the nation. Um, yeah, let me just say, I think, because I, I'm, um, as it's turned out, the ACA is half a single payer system. Half of the half of the coverage gains have been Medicaid. So it, it's turned out. That's right, in, in many places. And in a weird way, the, tr the problems with the exchanges uh, the, are, are going to mean that there's going to be a lot of reasons to introduce a, a public option. Um, maybe not everywhere, but any if, you know, if, if there's no private insurer willing to serve a place, then we can, and, and the, the, the idea had always been um, among some of us that a public option would little by little take over. And that you, of course, the insurance companies understood that too, which is one of the reasons why, why, it, why uh, it didn't happen on, on the first round. But you know, they, I think it, I, I think we may have the different visions of, of where we want, it's the same vision of where we want to go, but different visions of how to get there. And I would take so, Social Security, remember, Social Security was a half the population and very specifically not African Americans and ended up being what we have now, which is really not bad. I mean, my, my concern is that most of the potential administrative savings under single payer actually don't arrive until you've got only one insurer left. So when you can say to a hospital, you can abolish your billing department because um, there will only be one payer, and we're going to pay you like a fire department is paid, then you get the administrative savings, and you don't until that point. And I'm also concerned about the the public option. You know, we have an example in the Medicare program where we have a public option, the med traditional Medicare, competing with private uh, managed care plans that have essentially, that are increasingly outcompeting Medicare, not because they're more efficient in any way, but because they cheat. And, and um, you know, uh, and what we know in healthcare is that cheating actually overwhelms competence in almost any economic measure. <laughs> My mother uh, gets Medicare, and she wanted her traditional Medicare, and she was auto-enrolled into one of these private schemes, and she had to make, and she's, you know, 89 years old, had to make a zillion calls to try and get back the plan that she already had. So I, I think that's what you're describing is one of the ways you can Th cheat. That, and of, I mean, early on, um, you know, if you enroll people who don't actually need medical care as a private insurer, you get paid by Medicare and you don't have to lay out any money. So early on, they put the sign-up offices on the second floor of walk-up buildings. Um, <laughs> and um, subsequently, actually, as Medicare has outlawed that and, and has tried to adjust uh, with for risk in more sophisticated ways, turns out that the data are showing that the the cherry picking, the selective enrollment, has gotten more extreme, not less, over the last uh, 15 years. But we have seen real, very real, measurable increases in healthcare coverage, as imperfect as it is. Uh, yeah. and and as a doctor, I, I'm used to treating both pain and um, the long-term uh, needs of, of the patient. So when we have a, a patient with a, an acute problem, we both try and relieve their pain, which the Affordable Care Act made substantial progress on, and try and put in place longer-term measures that will result in cure. And I think, I, I whispered it to Paul, but I think in New York City, and I, don't, I have people from the department here, but I'm not sure the ones, they're the ones who would know, about three, per, three quarters of the new, newly insured were people who gained public health insurance. Yeah, it, it's actually, it, it's turning out, I think, actually, that Nixon's idea uh, and I guess we, uh, you know, we, we were always calling it uh, uh, Obama Romney care, but it's really Obama Romney Nixon care, and it's a, uh, and it's it's an ingenious thing that doesn't actually work all that well, especially because it's underfunded. But in some ways, it has established the principle that everyone's supposed to be able to get health care, and that may be in the end what matters. Good. I think we're going to go to some of the questions that that uh, you all may have in the public. So okay. 
So do we have any microphones for that? Yes, if you could. Um, Hi, thank you for such a illuminating evening, early evening. I wonder if any of you could address the intersection of income, race, and gender. So controlling for income, say, uh, and controlling for race, is there a gender effect, controlling for gender, et cetera? Question and I don't think that um, I don't think I have those data at my fingertips. Um, I, I did notice in uh, the paper that was co-authored uh, by Sam Dickman's paper that was co-authored by uh, David and Steffi that 20 percent of the of African American women are employed in the healthcare sector. Is I, that really struck me? Uh, but I don't think that's what you're actually interested in. <laughs> but uh, the, you know, in general, the health outcomes of, uh, of women are better than they are for men. Life expectancy is higher among women. That's true among blacks as well as whites. Um, so that the, um, the, the gender differential exists by race group. Black women doing less well, for example, in New York City, the maternal mortality ratio uh, difference between black women and white women is 12 to 1. It's the biggest disparity that we, uh, that we see uh, in uh, one of these sort of vital uh, event uh, outcomes. So, um, so the racial gap persists by gender uh, uh, um, with... You mean, it, yes, no, that's my whole point. Definitely. If I haven't gotten that across, I've failed this evening. Um, the, that's my whole point, that, that, that race is not a subset of income inequality. That yes, it is true that, um, that one of the ways, that, important ways that racism operates is to disproportionately distribute blacks into low income groups, but racism affects blacks of all income groups, uh, not only ones who are poor. It's not all accounted for by income. It's an independent predictor of outcomes. And you may have some well, data. I was just going to say that, that I, on health, we have the problem that there's a biological difference that, that kind of confounds it. But we do know that, that uh, other determinants of income, education, uh, there's still a huge gender effect. So it's not the case that, I mean, at this point, more women graduate in college than men. But the, so the basic answer is everything matters, that, that all of it, the racism, sexism, and just plain classism are all problems, all operating simultaneously. Uh, yes. Um, commissioner, as we know, diabetes is a prevalent and terrible disease, a center of disparities. It increases heart disease. 45% of dialysis is the result of diabetes. It causes amputations, the most amputations, it about doubles depression. It increases Alzheimer's risk by 40%, such as at least two of our boroughs have, now have 19% Alzheimer's rate among those 65 and older, and with the diabetes behind that, they might well be up to 50% Alzheimer's rate. And yet, at the same time, the city has no diabetes plan. It spends almost nothing on diabetes. It refuses to put one penny into the National Diabetes Prevention Program, which has been shown to reduce for pre-diabetics the risk that they will get diabetes by 60%. So I wonder how we can even claim in New York City that we are fighting disparities when the city will not address this disease. Previously, uh, but it's not accurate to say that the city spends nothing on diabetes, and it's not accurate to say that we don't invest in the National Diabetes Prevention Program. So I, d I don't think that we should have a dialogue here in front of the audience, but thank you for your comment, and I'd be happy to discuss it more with you. Uh, I would appreciate you. knowing how what I said was inaccurate, and I will be happy to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a question about the uh, 
the West Virginia case um, and race. Um, as I, I, I read once that um, a lot of folks don't know that the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare are the same thing. Um, so I, I wonder if the folks in West Virginia like Obamacare, like, like, like the Affordable Care Act, but don't like Obamacare and associate that with the black president. And could that be the race, the role race played in that? Uh, that, that is an issue, yeah. Uh, the uh, ACA has, has polled enormously better than Obamacare. Uh, um, <laughs> which is, it, and by the way, it's partly, it's not just that people don't, you know, are, 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 are uh, stupid. It, it, the, the, the politics, this is one of these things, I mean, and we had ties with these whole, whole, all these other issues. Um, as a way of making it politically saleable in the sense of being able to get it through Congress, it was set up as a, a federal state partnership so that in each state you have a program that looks like a state program and it's really all Obamacare, but in many cases people don't know that. I mean, in, in Kentucky, which was you know, then uh, not, not anymore, but it had the most successful rollout, there were a lot of people saying, boy, this uh, Connect program, that's great, it's so much better than Obamacare. And it was, in fact, of course, just, just a, a particularly well done. Um, now, I wonder about that in the case of West Virginia, because there are actually not a lot of people on the exchanges in West Virginia. It's just such a poor state that, by and large, people are getting it through Medicaid. And is it really possible, I suppose it's possible, that people who are getting Medicaid don't realize that Medicaid is a federal program. I mean, there, there certainly were. I mean, there, there are actual, it was not a joke. There really were people um, in, in, um, in in 2009 uh, with, with signs saying, you know, don't let the government get its hands on Medicare. So uh, it, it people, uh, there's a fair bit of political science research showing that, that large numbers of Medicare and Social Security recipients believe that they are not the beneficiaries of any government program. So there's a problem. I, I, I try not to be too, you know, there's a problem. People, people have lives. People People, as people have hard lives. They work multiple jobs. They're trying to raise kids. They get their news in snatches uh, from, from something they see on a TV in the corner. And uh, people are pretty poorly informed. And part of our problem is how do we, how do we let people know? Because uh, West Virginia ought to be, play, they ought to be singing hazanas at, at the, the benefits of, of government intervention to support their health. And they just don't know it. So uh, the 1970s uh, was an experience for New York City in terms of uh, austerity politics. Uh, it seems to me that the Trump administration uh, is likely to lead us again into such a situation. Uh, and I was interested if the panel has suggestions about how we might uh, resist that uh, and how we might struggle uh, to avoid getting into uh, an austerity situation in New York. I, I, let me just say that um, the um, uh, so far the record seems to be that when confronted by people who can actually fight back, uh, things tend not to happen. I mean, it's uh, there. Where you know the, there was a you know the the, uh, the Mexican peso is back to its pre-election level because they've decided that there ain't anything nothing is really going to happen there. Uh, the Chinese have decided that they're confronting a paper tiger. I'm not sure whether the city of New York has enough clout to, it, but it might. You know, so the, the I mean, uh, undocumented immigrants are fearful that they're gonna be deported and therefore afraid to report crimes and so on, they are terribly, terribly at risk because they have no leverage. I'm not sure that something as big as the city of New York is quite as powerless as you might fear. And you know, I don't, I don't think New York is gonna be Greece, put it that way. Although Puerto Rico is already, and it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. Well, I, I don't think we should underestimate. It takes it a while to get up to Magnifying my voice to underestimate the the failure of the first effort to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this and right uh, the I mean this is something that was a headliner for the Republican Party. Uh, it was something that they've said from that they wanted to do since the act passed, and that was way back in 2010. Uh, so they had seven years, and uh, they um, 
and you know it didn't even reach the floor. And I don't know what the latest. I haven't been looking at my phone, uh, but I the last thing I saw is they were saying they had the votes. But you know, I, so I think that that um, I, I I'm really pleased to hear a Nobel laureate uh, proclaiming uh, this more hopeful uh, because that's certainly how we're feeling as a city uh, that we we need to uh, stand and fight. Uh, that's the plan. I mean, even in the latest budget, the um, funding for the National Institutes of Health, for instance, was not not just maintained but actually increased. So, um, you know, despite a, a threat or a proposal, and Planned Parenthood, and Planned Parenthood has been Parenthood, cut by one percent. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I I think the evidence is mounting that large numbers of people protesting and saying to Congress people, uh, "What are you doing?" actually does have an effect. And I, I think for us in New York, you know, there was a time when uh, 200,000 abortions were done a year in New York City uh, before the passage of Roe versus Wade. Something like 80, between 80 and 90 percent of all the abortions done for women in Texas were done here in New York City. Um, but that number has now fallen down to something more like 60,000. Um, so I think it's really important when we talk about the importance of Planned Parenthood that we talk about all the other services that they provide. Uh, that they are, you know, offering women access to effective contraception, to cancer screening, um, and that for many women, uh, Planned Parenthood really is a, a, a an entry point for primary health care uh, for women who uh, don't have health insurance, which we've been talking a lot about this evening. Okay, we're going to try to get a couple of more questions before the the time kills us. <laughs> all, right, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, it was great, great talk. Um, in the issue of The Lancet, there's really an excellent review on mass incarceration and the effects on health, uh, both direct and indirect effects on health. But I think a lot of times in academia, our work gets siloed. So how have all of you tried to think about mass incarceration and how it, the interplay with your fields? Yeah, well, I, I'm sorry that it, because of time limitations in this conference, we actually did, couldn't ask the authors of that piece to, to present, which they did really very eloquently at, at the conference that we had in Boston. So I think that, that mass incarceration is actually an integral part of the racism th that afflicts our society and to some extent is also, a, in my, to my view, a, a reflection of the, the cost of enforcing inequality in our society. And it clearly has impacts not just on, on the health of prisoners, but on the health of, of their families and their communities. So. Um, as you point out, that, that article really, I, I thought, was, was quite striking in, in um, not just saying, well, there are two million people in, in jails and prisons right now and their health is profoundly affected, but, for instance, that it may well account for uh, a significant part of, of the gap between our infant mortality rate and that in other, other nations. So I, I think it is an important issue that, unfortunately, today we've said too little about. Thanks for bringing it up. Next question. Hi, um, I'm Caroline Lewis. I'm a healthcare reporter at Cranes. Um, and there was an equality index that is coming out this week that also shows, you know, better health outcomes among Hispanics, but lower access to health insurance. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, given that you're all in favor of single payer, how you respond to people, particularly Republicans, saying that, um, you know, access to health care and health insurance doesn't necessarily correlate with better health outcomes. Okay, um, I've read some of this stuff. A um, couple of things to say. It, first of all, it, um, it's a bit of a cheap shot, but I think a, a valid one. If that's the case, um, how many how many of the people who write such things uh, and have good health care plans from their employers uh, uh, choose to just not bother getting that health care because, after all, there's no real evidence it does any good, uh, right? We almost all assume that it does. Um, there is definitely a, a, a power of a statistical power issue. Uh, many of the, the cases that you've we've looked at, uh, you know, so the the Oregon lottery and so on, you can find a lot of differences in treatment. It's there's not a lot of there just isn't enough power in the numbers to to identify a lot of improvement in health. But that's probably just because it's too few people and too short of time period. Um, and look, other things matter. That's the it, Lots of things matter for for, for health. Uh, probably medical care is is uh, going to always 
fall secondarily to lifestyle, to genetics. There, you know, there's all, yeah, if, if you're gonna find a, a you know, my, my, uh, uh, my 94 year old mother-in-law who I don't think has ever eaten a, a meal that didn't include pork products um, and, um, and, and is a, a, in amazing shape and you're gonna say, well, therefore diet doesn't matter. Uh, no, it's just that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. Thank you, next. Let me just say that, that uh, in the current issue of the American Journal of Public Health, Steffi Willhandler and I actually have a review on on uh, all of the studies looking at the relationship between uninsurance and, and mortality rates. And there's a very clear pattern that the uninsured have higher mortality, even in the Oregon Health Experiment, which um, the confidence intervals are wide, but the point estimate is actually very much in keeping with the other studies for how many people, for about 800 people who are uninsured for a year, one of them will die. Our next one. So I have a, a question because you raised the issue of health disparities for African American, Latino communities, and I would say Asian Americans across all of those groups. But one of the issues is mental health care, right? So the ACA actually picked up mental health care, um, and if we get rid of all of that, we don't have access to mental health care. And a lot of the things you all just discussed are things like toxic stressors, so poverty is a toxic stressor that has an effect on all of those other outcomes, which would be health. And then there's the mental health. So can you, can you just maybe address that a little bit? Well, I, I think we, that we, sh we absolutely should acknowledge that the, the notion of parity, mental health parity, has been really important. Uh, the removal of the cap and the ability of people to access mental health care is an important benefit. Uh, and one that was supported by the Affordable Care Act, which uh, came up with uh, other things that uh, reduce the cost and the cost barrier to care by, you know, for example, access to colonoscopies or to uh, contraceptives or um, to mammography. Or copays were removed for those, uh, and the uh, ability to um, to get a rid rid. I think it was it Sam Dickman who wrote about this uh, your paper more on the kind of lifetime caps or dollar caps on care, including mental health. So uh, absolutely, those were real benefits. OK, I, um, I think I'm being told that we've run out of time. I, I think so. I want to invite everybody up for a reception. And um, I also really want to thank our speakers. They just did a fabulous job. Thank you.